Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Book of Acts. How many know that this book is called the book of the Acts of the Apostles? In almost every Bible. How many know that it's not the book of the Acts of the Apostles? It's the book of the Acts of the Holy Ghost on the first church. It is the Holy Ghost anointing men and women to carry out the will of God. Okay? So it's not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts. It, it, actually, it doesn't even call itself that. It's kind of like the book of Revelation. If you open up your Bible and look over there, it says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. And then the first verse says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Which one is it? Well, the man added the St. John the Divine part. It, the, the, the Holy Ghost put in the revelation of, Saint, uh, of, the, of Jesus Christ. Amen? So this is the acts of the Holy Spirit operating through the church. And how many know where we're living? There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. We're living in Acts 29. Because it hasn't finished being written. We're still carrying out the will and purpose of the God. Amen? We are still the dispensational church of the Holy Spirit, the, new, the, the church age, praise God. We're still carrying those things out. Now, Acts chapter 1, we talked about last week, as we were talking about the, uh, keeping the power of Pentecost in the church. Talked about that Pentecost was the festival 50 days after Passover. Had, had the Holy Spirit come on, the, on Rosh Hashanah, we've been called Rosh Hashanahs. It's a joke. Come on, are y'all with me? Thank you, Nathan. Not such sarcastic. <laughs> if it came on the Feast of Tabernacles, we've been called Tabernacleists. But it came on Pentecost, so we call it, we're called Pentecostals. Charismatics, another word we use, and that comes from the word charis, which means gifts. So we're, you know, charismatic, hallelujah. Word of faith coming from, you know, the teaching revival of the 70s and 80s, where uh, the highlight was put on teaching the word of God. So we're kind of Pentecostal, word of faith, charismatics. We're just all hodgepodge in there, all right? But we talked about keeping the power of Pentecost in the church. We cannot lose that Pentecost. Did y'all did hear that? I just heard a little bit of a flow back. Okay. Uh, oh, I just heard a, t a tweak. All right. Acts chapter 1. Remember, Jesus told them to go and tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Talked about last, I'm, this is going to be a quick recap, okay? So hold on to your seats. How that, in, you know, Jesus and Matthew told them that all power or all exousia, all authority has been given to me, heaven and earth, therefore you go in in my name. So the church has been delegated authority, exousia, but it's all, that word actually is translated power in the New Testament. But it's a different word altogether. It means authority. So we, the church has gotten authority, been granted authority from the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, to use his name and to go forth in his name and carry out his will. Then here in Acts, he says, goes tarry in Jerusalem until you be due with power, not exosia, but dunamis, miracle power in the Greek, <coughs> from Ohio, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. See, we were granted authority to go in his name, but he says, don't go anywhere until you get the power to go in my name. Or the miracle power, or the supernatural power. So we got the authority, which is back up now when you get filled with the Holy Ghost with the dunamis. So the exorcia and the dunamis going together, the church goes out and carries out and does the will of Jesus in the earth. Amen? And so on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the room where they were sitting there, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, as the, and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. I told you this is fast recap. We're going to slow down in a minute. If you weren't here last week, go back and listen to last week. I'm just, as a recap. All right? <clears throat> and they were, this, then they prophesied, the old men of, uh, were uh, dream dreams, the young men of see visions. And I said this, thank God I'm still seeing visions. I think Dick told me last week he had a dream. Anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And, but when we look through the book of Acts, throughout the book of Acts, there are signs, wonders, and miracles taking place all through the book. Whenever they got persecuted, they ran back to their own company. They got filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. Why? Because we need to stay full. Amen. Say, I got to stay full. 
Now, if you get in your car today, go get on Interstate 40 heading west. You can, in, in 1,060 miles, you hit one turn, you get on um, the Muskogee Turnpike, you head up to Tulsa for 50 miles, or 52 miles, 58 miles, I'm sorry, to Broken Arrow. You can get to Tulsa or Broken Arrow, Oklahoma with your automobile. You look at that car, it's got so many horsepower on the engine, it's got such a, and then they measure it in liters. Now, we used to remember, remember measuring them in cubic inches. It had a 454 or a 455. Remember that? You talked about the size of the engine in cubic inches, not in liters. Now it has a 3.8 liter. All that means is how much water it displaces when you put it in water, all right? It displaces that much water. Anyway, you can have all that power in that engine. You can have power steering, power brakes, power windows, power this, power that, and then the power of the engine under the hood. You can get yourself a Corvette and you go out there. I don't know, I don't know how big the engines are, but they put out a lot of horsepower. Zero to 120 in two seconds. I mean, Sandy let me borrow hers one time when we had the van over there to get some body work on it. I got to borrow her Z6 Corvette. And I went and picked Nathan up, and the kids all go riding with me. We got over on the Groomtown ramp. And from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp, in second gear, I was doing 83 miles an hour. And that's when I backed off. I hadn't even got in third yet. Second, I was at 83. And coming down that ramp, just yeah. 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 We think goose. <laughs> Top gun. All right. <clears throat> so you can have all the power, but if you don't keep the power fueled, you won't get there. You can leave here and start heading to Tulsa, and if you get about 20 miles a gallon, got a 20 gallon tank, you get about 400 miles. If you don't stop putting more fuel in there, you're going to run out of gas, and all that power available to you does you no good because you're not fueled. And the church has come to the point that we've, we've, we're running out of fuel, we're pulling our pretty cars off to the side of the road, got all this power that God has granted us to use, and we're not keeping it fueled to get the work of God done. We're calling people to come into our churches and climb our rock walls. We're calling people to come into our churches and be involved in our you know, gardening group. We're calling people to come into our churches you know, and drink wine with their dinner. We're calling people to come into our churches and do all kinds of things when we're not inviting people to come and see and, and be in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost who can come on them and in one second or two seconds, in, in just a moment of time, ra eradicate the works of the enemy in their life. Hallelujah. Five seconds in the presence of God could do you more good than 20 years in counseling. You can go see counselors all the time. And they can sit there and tell you, like one guy said, he came in to, came in to see a counselor one day, and he's sitting there waiting for him. He comes walking in with an umbrella, cat over his arm, glasses on down to here, and still lives with his mama. And asked the guy that was needed counselor, said, said, how do you feel today? Uh, he said, uh, he said, I feel ugly. He said, lie face down on the couch. You know, I mean, you know, we, you can go to counseling, 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 but you can come into the presence of God, come into the contact where people are full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and all the junk you've been going through and all the stuff you're dealing with, the power of God can eradicate it. That's why the church is to stay full. Okay, so last week we talked about, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, we need to have the Holy Ghost or the Pentecost experience. We kind of brushed by, and we, like I said over in Winston this morning, we, we went two different directions in both churches and done them with what I was supposed to do. I was in Winston, I went off over here, got over here, and I went off over there, and then here are my notes going right here. Shocker. I know how comedians feel with a hard crowd. You guys are being a little tough this morning. Lighten up. Hallelujah. You know, this Pentecostal experience is an ongoing one. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. I hate glasses. That's why I keep taking them on and off. Even though I got progressive lenses, I can look up. They're not there. I just don't like having them on my face. All right? So if it bothers you, I'm sorry. If it bothers you on television, I'm sorry. All right. But Paul wrote to the church. Look over in Ephesians 5. Eight. Just look over there in your own Bible. So you won't think I'm making it up. Which would mean I'm lying to you, and I don't lie, so. And I don't evangelistically speak either. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. says, Be not drunk or intoxicated with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the, word, the Greek verbiage intenses here you know king james is, is limited to one word translation so sometimes you can't fully give 
what the, the original writers were saying in its fullest sense because you're doing a word for word. Here, the Greek verb and, and, and the tense is not be filled, but be continually filled. It's an ongoing process. But be, actually, literally, but ye, be ye being filled in a constant state of being filled. Okay? You just got to stay all the time. You got to stay full all the time, all the time, all the time. You ever been over to like a, a Dairy Queen or an ice cream place and they got the water running in a little thing and they, they keep putting their scoopers in there and they just run it over all the time because they keep getting fresh water that keeps all, all the stuff off the spoon and it keeps it fresh. <coughs> Our lives are to stay being, being filled. With what? The Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spirit, not just songs, spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Hallelujah. See, we're to stay full. Amen? Let's say, we're to stay full. You don't, need to be, you don't need to be empty. Now, how many know what happens if your car runs out of gas? Now, there's a couple things that happen. One is, you get air up in the line. Sometimes they won't re-crank. Now, if you go empty, then sometimes you have to go actually have them bled out to get that gas back up because it blocks the line up. So you just never want to run out. If you've ever run out of gas, you know it's a disconcerting situation. How many know what I'm talking about? Mama! Hello? It's, it's no fun to run out of gas. And see, the church needs to stop being empty, and we need to stay full. Now, if you ever drive, and like we drive to Tulsa, we've driven to Tulsa a number of times over the years, going back to Raymond and so forth, and from the county, we put the kids in there and have beds for them. They'd be asleep watching little televisions. We would cigarette light adapters. We'd have them all in there watching some, you know, some, something on television. You know, we record Mother Goose, Ner the Christian Mother Goose, all the different Christian comment things. We, have, we just have hours of it. Just put it in there. We're driving 17 hours straight. Y'all can watch TV. All right, and they'd be back there. Nathan be in the seat. <laughs> Shannon's sitting there going. <laughs> and Jesse's right behind you. Mama, how come? Mama, how come? Mama, how come? <laughs> Jesse, watch the TV. Mama, how come? My, uh, okay, anyway. But here's what we, we always did when we're driving. Now you start getting around 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're on empty, and you start exit hopping and nobody's open, that's not good. So what do we do? 11 o'clock, you fill up. You know, if, you, if you're going down the road, you see one open, you, you go ahead and fill up again. Because you might hit a straight space in there, you're driving straight through, and, and somebody might not be open, and you're, you're out of gas. And the church doesn't need to be riding down the road, running out of gas, when there's opportunities to stay full of the Holy Ghost. See, where do we be being filled? Where do they stay full? How do you stay full? Well, you know, uh, we, you need to just, just be praying in tongues. Hallelujah. Amen. I said, you know, Jude 20 says, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, doing what? Praying in the, the Holy Ghost or praying in the Spirit. Paul equates praying in the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit as praying in tongues. Read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, he that, pray, he that uh, prayeth in the Spirit, his understanding is unfruitful. Why? Because he's praying in tongues. So praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues, not fervent prayer. That means fervent prayer. Then why is your understanding unfruitful? Honestly. If it just means fervent prayer, you know what you're saying. Your understanding is not unfruitful. It knows exactly what you're saying. You can be anointed to pray in the natural or in, the, in your language. But prayer in the Spirit is praying in the Holy Ghost. In the way that Paul used the word, terminology. So James says, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in tongues. It charges you up. He that prayeth in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Charges himself up like a battery. Anybody ever had your all in there to go out? What happens next? So does everything else. The lights start going. And then the car goes. And it's not gas. <clears throat> all in there went out. It's not charging the battery. You can go put a brand new battery in there. And it'll do the same thing. Until you fix the alternator so it stays charging. Your life will keep going if you don't keep yourself charged. 
And we as charismatic Word of Faith people have bought into the lie of it's all about us. Let's just have a good time at church. Let's have a light show. Let's have a smog, smog show or fog show. Or, you know, it's a smoggy, foggy. As far as I'm concerned, the spirit is smog. Smoke and mirrors. Why? Why would Satan try to get the church? Listen, I, I'm just, don't get condemned, but I am telling you, you go back and listen to the old Pentecostals, and they had a fog would show up in our room, and there wasn't a fog machine doing it. It was the glory of God would show up. Are you here? The glory of God would come in, and people would get healed that weren't even believing. People would get saved that came there going, I don't even believe all that. He's just knocking them down. And then the glory rolled in. That Hagin saw him up in, the, up in the balcony. Then the glory walked in, rolled in. He saw it come in. All of a sudden, that man started going. You know, he'd been fussing the whole service. They're knocking him down. I don't believe all that stuff. And his wife said, oh, God, I just wish I hadn't brought him. She'd been asking for years, trying to get him in the church. But then the glory showed up. Hallelujah. Not the fog show. Not the light show. But the glory of God rolled in. And it hit that man. And as he later get to hear Dad Hagin's story, because he saw it in the spirit, all of a sudden that man started going, it's a going all over me. It's a going all over me. It's a going all over me. His wife said, what's a going all over you? He said, he said, he said, that a glory he's talking about. It's a going. He got instantly healed, born again, and baptized in the Holy Ghost. He had a heart problem. He was going to die. See? When we get to where the church is full of power, you know, remember John Paul says, choose out seven people, deacons. What are they going to do? Feed the women. And they had to be full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Why did they need to be full of faith and the Holy Ghost? So when they showed up at the house to fix the screen door, and there was a problem there that was beyond fixing the screen door, the Holy Ghost could come and minister and bring relief by the Spirit. Because they were walking in the power, not in the flesh. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. We've, let, we've let go of things we've had. We've let, you know, and remember in Hebrews it says, you know, we need to be more earnest, lest any time we let these things slip. I believe the charismatic word of faith, uh, Pentecost church has let things slip, but God is calling us back. Because I am telling you, in the hour that we are living in, we're going to have to be back in the flow of the Spirit because there's stuff going on that's all over this world. And let me tell you something. <clears throat> the dark gets darker, but the light's got to be getting lighter. And we're not going to win the world playing games. We got the power in the name of Jesus. Garrett, what was that, man? We short circuit the whole place. Are you back home? You, you ever went off? All right. They miss a beat. So what we, what we, we are calling you, let's keep the power of Pentecost in the church. Don't say, I had that. I say, I grew up classical Pentecostal. We tarry at the altar. We go down to the altar. Oh, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, I'm seeking for the Holy Ghost. They'd have Sister Shirley. Uh, well, I forgot Sister Shirley's last name. Dixon, I think her name was. She'd come in, and she held a revival. And she'd come up and grab your jaws. I mean, she'd get you like this and go, that's <laughs> Right behind him was Brother Paramore going, hang on. <laughs> Brother Moore's over here going, let go. <laughs> you got one over here going, shout praise the Lord. <laughs> you got another one over here going, shout hallelujah. <laughs> I think they finally got the other one said, say, yabba dabba do. All right. <clears throat> hallelujah. We thought, man, if we tarry and we get filled, oh, and then, and then we get filled with the Holy Ghost, they wouldn't even come anymore. They wouldn't go to the altar anymore. They wouldn't come to church on special services. You say, why ain't you here? Didn't you hear? I got it. I got the baptism. Hey, pinhead. That was so you could go to the altar. That's so you could stay full. That's so you could do something for Jesus. That wasn't so you could stay home and watch TV. <coughs> Are you here? But we Pentecostals thought, whoo, I got it. And then we go, it took me 15 years to get the baptism. I appreciate it. No, no, no. For that 15 years you were waiting, I've been out here praying in the tongues. I've been getting stuff done for Jesus while you're over here waiting. Amen? Amen? Yeah. See, it's not, it's not an experience for the purpose of you getting a re, you know, your, your merit badge, your Holy Ghost merit badge. I got my born again. I got my, you know, baptized in water. Now I got my baptized in the Holy Ghost merit badge. Now I've arrived. I'm going to sit down. Now you're qualified to go out and do something. If the church walked in the power, 
that God granted us and did in the beginning, we wouldn't be sitting around trying whining about we, we, what's going on. We wouldn't have our churches sitting over here trying to convince people to come in by being like them. Hello? They were so radical. They came and preached in one place at Antioch, and they preached a Jesus to the point, that, and they acted like what they preached. They finally said, and they first called them Christians at Antioch. They weren't going around calling themselves Christians, which means Christ-like or literally little Christ. They acted so much like who they were preaching like. They said, they're, they're, they're Christ-like. They're Christians. Hello? Are you a Christian? Yeah, I go to a, a, a uh, I go to a very uh, open church. We uh, we drink, we smoke, we we uh, we have partner switches because we can show people the love of God that way. We're open to all kinds of people of all kinds of identities. There's a new one out. Men, we got people, men identifying as puppies. Knew it was coming. They identify as human puppies. That's how they identify. Ben's over here about it. <laughs> and the church is trying to coddle and bring people in and let them stay the way they are. And we were never intended to let people stay as they are. We were to go make disciples, turn them, make, get them born again, get them filled with the Holy Ghost, and then teach them and let them grow up to be disciples, disciplined, Christ-like. And we can't do that with Mickey Mouse games, acting like the world, pretending to be one thing and, dip, and, and give another. Uh, how many of you have ever gone to the restaurant and you got that piece of cherry, I mean cheesecake, with the cherries all over it, the syrup just running down? It's about that tall and it's a wedge about that big. And your mouth is just drooling and it's four ninety five. You think, oh my God, four ninety five for that. Look at that. I want the cheesecake. And it comes out to the table. It's about a third as high. It's a wedge like this. There's two cherries with a drizzle of syrup on it. Hello. And you're like The government even passed a law called the Truth and Advertisement Act. You can't do that legally. You're presenting one thing and delivering another. And the church has been presenting, you can get to heaven and delivering, stay like you are. Instead of having them come in and have a confrontation with the power of God. Hallelujah. That when they come into the presence of God, they're shaken in their inner man because the Spirit of God is holy. He's not a play toy. Remember, we can grieve the Holy Ghost. And he's calling the church back to living a holy life, living a life of power. Well, I've got things in my life. The Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit sent to help deliver you and keep you clean. He's not mad with you. He'll help you if you let him. But it's time we let him and stop justifying it and whatever way you've justified it, and whatever way people tell you, you can justify it and say no longer. The Spirit of God calls you to love God and hate sin. Wigglesworth got on a train one time in England, sat down beside an Anglican. There, England, the Episcopal Church over there is called Anglican. Any, well, actually, anywhere in the world except America is called Anglican. Okay. And uh, sat down beside an Anglican priest and just sat there for a few minutes, didn't do anything, just sat there. And find them that the priest jumps up, looks at him and says, My God, man, you convict me of sin. And ran to another car. He didn't do anything. No, but the Jesus in him did. The Holy Ghost in him did. He got off on that man and he knew that he was in the presence of someone who walked with a holy God. Even being a priest, he was convicted of sin. And see, that's where the church has got to get back to. Not, convicted, not, not condemn them of sin, but convict them of sin. What's the difference? See, condemning them, saying, you're, you're sorry, you're going to hell, eh, doesn't have an answer. Conviction offers an answer. You don't have to stay that way. You can come to know Jesus. And Jesus said you'll know the truth, not facts. The fact is you're a sinner. The truth is you're lost in sin, but I have the answer. 
Amen. You're bound by sin, but he whom the Son will set free is free indeed. Come to me. Come to Jesus. Yeah, you've been living like a dog. You've been living in sin. I mean, you're, I mean, the things you've been doing, we can't even talk about what you've been doing, but don't worry about it. Because the God of heaven has the blood of Jesus that will wash you clean. Hallelujah. And he'll deliver you from the power of that. Hallelujah. And establish you in righteousness. But the church is sitting around saying, you don't have to change. You're under grace. And you can just live any way you want to because you're under grace. Now, you say, well, they don't really say that. I've all, all but heard them say it. How do you know that? First John 1 John 1.9 doesn't belong to the church. We don't repent when we sin. Now, the guy said that, wrote the book, on television everywhere, told someone privately that I know personally very well. Friend, I would consider them good friends. They went to see him and said, what do you do when you sin? He said, I tell the Lord I'm sorry. Really? Yeah. I go to the Lord and tell him I'm sorry. But you tell everybody else not to repent. Because go and tell the Lord you're sorry. He's repenting. Well, then why don't you preach that? Well, if I preach that here, uh, I'll, they'll go back into the bondage of captivity they were once in. You've got more faith in your half-cocked message than you do in what Jesus said. Because Jesus said you'll know the truth and it'll set you free. Now, Jesus said give them the truth and it'll set them free. You're saying if you give them the whole truth, it'll put them back in captivity. So you got more faith in your message. It's a lie. Actually, here's the way. He said, so what do you do when you sin? I go to the Lord. Well, what do you tell the Lord? I tell him I'm sorry. But yet they get in the pulpit and preach, no, we don't repent. We never repent for sin. See, this is the stuff we're doing. We're, we're, we, we got, and we sell millions of books and we get millions of dollars from television because we're giving people, making people feel good. People run all over the world and writing new Bibles that don't have 1 John 1, 9 in it because that, that's not the revelation of Paul. And Jesus said, when you hear the truth, and what, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. It's the word that will liberate them, not your message. If your message isn't the word, you don't need to preach it. You don't need to preach a message that countermands the word of God because it, you think culturally it'll, be, it'll, it'll hurt your culture. Your lack of faith, your lack of faith disturbs me. I can't. Your lack of faith disturbs me. All right, is that better? All right. No, here, going home. See, the church, if we stay full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says this. And, and the reason I get fed up with this stuff is people get up there, they say, well, the Lord showed me, and the Lord showed me, and the Lord showed me. Yeah, but, but where, did he, where did he show you? Because Jesus, you know, after Jesus ascended, said they went everywhere preaching the Word. The Lord working with them, confirming the Word with signs following not there, the Lord showed me. I believe the Lord shows us something, but you know what? The Lord, the Lord will always show you what the Word says. I remember Dad Hagen's story. Remember the story he was having a vision of Jesus, and the little demon came out, and the little demon started going, yak it yak yak it yak It's up a smoke screen. He couldn't see the Lord. He couldn't hear the Lord. He could, he could tell the Lord was talking, but he couldn't hear what he was saying. And after, after a while, he finally got fed up and said, in the name of Jesus, shut up. And the demon went, plop. As a matter of fact, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And he got out and ran off. He looked back at the Lord. He missed all the stuff the Lord was saying. And the Lord looked at him and said, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. Brother Hagin went, now, Lord, I know I misunderstood you. Probably just about like that. Lord, I know you said you wouldn't have. You didn't say you couldn't have. He said, the Lord looked at him again and said, I said, if, I told, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. Now, Lord, I, something's wrong here. I know I'm not hearing you right. I know you said that you wouldn't have, not that you couldn't have. And about the third time he did that, he said, he, said, he said, fire came out of his eyes. There are times when the Lord's tired of messing around with you and not listening. He said, fire came out of his eyes. He said, I said I wouldn't. I didn't say I couldn't. And Brother Hagin looked at him and said, okay, Lord, 
I'll accept that, but you're going to have to show it to me in at least three scriptures in the Bible because you said out of, every, well, let, out of mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He said, I'll do you one better. I'll give you four. He knows the word better than we do. <laughs> Amen? And took it to four different scriptures and showed it to him where we had the authority and it was granted to the church and, not, he, and we were supposed to operate in it, not him. Now, you got people running around, Lord, do something about the devil. Lord, take this back a habit. You know, the Lord's not going to take it. He don't want your backer. He don't smoke. Hello? Are you here? Lord, take this, Lord, take this back away from me. He don't want it. <coughs> Are you here? We have to take authority over things in our life. Now, the Spirit of God will aid you, and he'll help you. He'll, 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 he'll undergird you. But you've got to do something about it. You've got to take authority over this stuff. Say, in the name of Jesus, no! What well, has to fulfill? N next time. In the name, you just stay, you say, you say, I will not be bound. I will not be controlled by anything. The only thing I'll be controlled with is Jesus. I am going to be yoked together with him and nothing else. Which means when you're yoked with something, it guides you. Nothing else in my life will control me except Jesus. You got to say those things. Amen. I said amen. I got off on all that because the church has become an entertainment industry trying to get enough back ends in the seat to get enough money to support the animal we've created. Well, we got, you know, I mean, we got a five and a half million dollar building we're in. We got to pay the payment. So we ain't going to make anybody upset. Well, I can't upset anybody bad enough to mess us up now because we, we got a monthly lease. If y'all leave, I just go home and have it in my living room. And it didn't stop me before when we had the, you know, the more expensive building and stuff. That didn't stop us before from preaching the truth. And it makes people mad sometimes. I'm not going to compromise truth because Jesus said that's what set people free. Hello. And they, you, they can all run, people can run off and go to the, the happy, clappy church that lets them hear what they want to hear. But in the hour of crisis, they're not going to have what they need. Last week, I think I shared about the meme was on Facebook. 1944, 18-year-olds stormed the beaches of Normandy uh, uh, with almost uh, certain death, in the face of almost certain death. 2016, we create safe zones on college campuses because people might get offended by somebody else's speech. I thought, dear God, thank God we're not having a war war right now because if that bunch had to go fight for us, we're in trouble. <laughs> Big trouble. They'd be like, they'd be like the one, yeah, red car. How about this one? You know, they, they said about, I won't say the nation's name, but the army was selling weapons after the war. It said, never use, only drop once. <laughs> it was a European nation. <clears throat> they don't speak English. That's as far as I'm going. And it wasn't the Germans because they were taking over. All right. Never used, only drop once. We've, we're raise, raising a church of safe zones who don't want to be called homophobic, don't want to be called hate mongers, who are afraid to preach the truth, pastors who, pastors who are not pastors standing in the pulpits condoning every sin under the sun so they can get that money that comes in that door and have that person in the seat under the guise that they're going to reach them in love. Love tells you the truth. In love. Speak the truth in love. That we're commanded. It was not a request, by the way. It's a command from Scripture to speak the truth in love. See, my motivation to tell somebody that if you keep doing this, you're going to hell, is not to make them feel bad. It's to let the Holy Spirit convict them to draw them out so they can go to heaven and be delivered. Not so that they'll perish into everlasting uh, fire. But I'm a hate monger if I tell them the truth. No. I love you. You know who the hate monger is? The person who won't tell you the truth. They're the hate monger. And they really are the homophobics. They're afraid of your reaction if you tell them the truth. I don't care what your reaction is. I'm going to give you the truth. And if you don't accept it, I can't, I can't be responsible for that. My responsibility is to give you the truth. I love you. I'm going to give you the truth. But if you reject that, that's between you and God. 
Hello. And the church needs to be so full of power. Boy, over in Acts, I believe Acts chapter 4, remember they, they got beat? They said, don't you teach or preach in the name of Jesus. Okay. Go back to the own company. Lord, ran unto your service that with all boldness we may speak, we may preach thy word and speak in the name of thy holy child Jesus by stretching forth thine hand to heal. What do they do? You tell me I can't do it? I'm sorry. Give us more. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They got filled again. They got charged back up again. And they ran right back out to that same crowd, that same bunch, and did the same thing again. Then he goes, what are we going to do? We got a court injunction that says we can't say anything about Jesus. Because we mentioned the name of Jesus. Somebody's going to be offended. It's better they get offended here and you preach it than be offended at you going to hell. You need to be full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Um, we're not going to get anywhere else this morning. There's so many places I can go. Uh, let me give you a couple things real quick, okay? Keys to maintaining power. Number one, Paul gave prominence to speaking in tongues. You know how you, I know that? 1 Corinthians 14 18. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. Greek. It's a little play on the word here. Because the, Corinth, the church at Corinth was out of line. Remember it says that Paul wrote, they said, you come behind and no gift. But... You're, out of, you're, out, you're wacky. Now, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Paul's saying, guys, I love it that you're zealous for God. We've got to rein you in just a little bit because you're nutbags with it. Okay? Come to church. Everybody tries to give a prophecy. Everybody tries to give a tongue. Everybody tries to give interpretation. Everybody's trying to do everything in every service. So he writes and tells them, hey, look, guys, look. 1 Corinthians 14. This is why I'm saying this is a guideline letter more than a somebody sit down and count. Okay, one, two, three. That's it. No one else prophesied today. He says, someone prophesies, let it be two. The prophets speak, let it be two or three of the most, and the others judge. Why was he writing that? Because they were so wild and wild. And he's trying to bring them with, back with, okay, let, let's, listen. Here, here, here's what I'm going to tell you. You guys are zealous, but I think you need to calm, just, let's pull it back in. Let's go two or three at a time. Same thing with tongues. He said the same, the same thing about tongues. And get this thing in line. It wasn't to have a counter out there going, that's it. Oh, we got three. No more. The idea here, in, in, in the purpose of this, remember, why was it written? Who was it written to? Under what circumstances was it written? It was written to the church at Corinth, a baby church, who was f just crazy about the gifts. They thought they had found the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread, and they hadn't even discovered that yet. <laughs> All right? And Paul said, okay, I love it you guys are zealous. But you know what? Because of the way you're doing this, you're bringing, you're bringing a reproach and you're bringing a confusion. So let's... Let's control this. Two or three, okay? That's, that's the tone of what he's writing. Not a legalistic, logistical, all right, Jessica's the designated counter for this service. When they hit three, we need to know. Okay? No, it was, it was to bring it back into order. Okay? And he even says at the very end, he says, now don't go off the other end and forbid people to speak in tongues. I, I want you all to prophesy, but forbid no man to speak in tongues. Says that at the end of the chapter. So don't, don't, go, don't go from one ditch to the other, which we always do. Don't forbid anybody speaking tongues. Okay? But Paul said, because we know this church was always, they're always, they're speaking in tongues here, they're speaking in tongues everywhere. They get in church all over. Paul says, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. But the Greek says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you, or all of you put together. That made Paul one tongue-talking dude. He went to bed speaking. He got up speaking. He traveled speaking. But when he got to the church, he made sure that whatever he did was to the edification of the church and not for himself. Read it. That's what he's talking about. But no, he gave prominence to speaking in tongues. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you. Did he go to the next week? Yeah, in the church. In the church. When he's at church... He'd rather speak five words with his understanding than 10,000 words in tongues that he may instruct people. Okay, now the motivation here is not that I'm going to get personally edified, that when I get with people, I want to make sure I can edify them. Now, I'm speaking in tongues. I'm doing more all of you put together. Can you see the tone of what he's saying? But you got people come along. See, Paul said tongues aren't important. Really? He told you not to. 
and, and, and in our Bible school, we forbid it, then you're out of the will of God. And you're in direct rebellion to written scripture. How about that one, pal? You're in direct rebellion to the written word. Forbid no man to speak with tongues. Well, that all passed away. Now, where does it say it passed away? Now, I've got scripture that tells you you can't forbid it. Give me scripture that tells you you can. And until you can't, shut up. Because you're rebelling against God and his holy word. We don't rebel against God and his holy word. Even when we don't like it. Amen? So Paul gives prominence to speaking to us. Second, it's a supernatural means of communicating with God. The second verse of uh, chapter 14 here says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God, for in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. The word mysteries means divine secrets. It's a supernatural means of communing with God. Hallelujah. We need to commune with God. And the good thing about this, the devil don't know what you're saying. Hallelujah. He's going, what, huh, what, huh, shut up. All right. Thirdly, it's a supernatural means of, of spiritual edification. We already quoted Jude 20. But ye, beloved, build up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then Romans chapter 8, we're going to cover this very quickly, and then we'll pick up the rest of this next week. Romans chapter 8 helps us pray in line with God's will. We need to be, listen, if we're going to have the church doing the will of God, we know we've got to know what the will of God is. And we've got to be walking in the will of God. We can't be walking around in Mickey Mouse stuff. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Take Greek, three Greek words makes the word help. Takes hold together with against. That's what those three different Greek words being put in together, helpeth. Our infirmities. This is not mean sicknesses. It literally means in this place weaknesses or inabilities. Okay. Not, not, you know, he helps our sickness. He helps your weaknesses. How do you know? If we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You might, need, you might know what to pray for. You may not know how to do it right. The Holy Spirit prays it right. The Holy Spirit prays it exactly the way it's supposed to be prayed. Amen? And then as Brother Roberts used to teach, uh, you know, after you've prayed it out in the Holy Ghost, pray, ask for God for the interpretation. First person I ever heard say it was Brother Roberts. And then other people picked up on it. By the way, Oral Roberts preached my graduation from Rama. That was an awesome graduation service. <laughs> Sit a year under Dad Hagen, Oral Roberts preached your graduation. Hallelujah. Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle, Demas Shakarian, Fred Price. Um, who else can I think of? All came to Rama that year and talked for a week. Then Dad Hagen taught for three weeks uh, in special seminars, plus classes. It wasn't a bad year. T.L. Osborne came. Hallelujah. Not for a week, but for a service. Wow. Say that backwards. Wow. <laughs> then I came along and added, say it upside down. Mom. Anyway. <coughs> Brother, Brother Osborne would get up and he'd greet you in English, and then he'd greet you in French, and then he'd greet you in Spanish. And he stopped after that and he said, if you could speak English, French, or Spanish, you could communicate with 90% of the world's population. For a missionary, you could communicate with 90%. See, the, the French colonize all over Asia. So you can go to Asia and, pre and, and preach in French and, and, and they hear you. You can go to South America and other places on in Spanish. You know, northern, Fran northern Africa is, uh, is uh, French. Southern Africa and so forth is English. You can communicate with 90% of the world's population speaking three languages. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered or in uttered in articulate speech. So the Spirit helpeth us. Amen? And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit will lead you into prayer that is in line with the will of God. 
That's why we've got to keep Pentecost alive. We've got to, stay, we've got to be Pentecostals all the time. We've got to stay full of the Holy Ghost so we can, we can communicate with God. We can, um, we can have spiritual edification. We can pray in the line with the will of God. And we are now equipped and prepared to go carry the dunamis to function under the exorcia that Jesus gave us as the head of the church to win the world to him. Instead of bringing them up to a Mickey Mouse mess where everybody comes in there and they're all living in sin but they're under grace. And wouldn't know the Holy Ghost if he knocked them down and slapped them upside the head with a two-by-four. Hello. That Brother Hagin said one time, he said, people wouldn't recognize the Holy Ghost sometimes if he walked in with, with, a, with a white hat and a red feather in it. Yeah, I guess in that day that was really something. Praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving